Hi, I'm Leslie Burby, Editor-in-Chief of Autism Parenting Magazine, and today I'm here with Jennifer Cook O'Toole. Hi. <laughs> and Jennifer is a public speaker and an author, as well, and as well, she has Asperger's, her husband is Asperger's, and all three of her children have Asperger's. She's won We're several awards. <laughs> what? We're overachievers. Yeah. <laughs> She's won several awards and books, um, written uh, several books uh, relating, all relating to Asperger's. So I want to thank you, Jennifer, for joining me today. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to be here. So can you tell our readers that aren't familiar with your story uh, when you realized you had Asperger's? Sure. So um, everything Asper Kids really um, has, has taken off like crazy in the last couple of years. Um, and I think that's because when you're speaking from a first person perspective and, and you know from that inside place and with a message of, hey, it's gonna be okay, guys. It's all right, you know, a little bit geek-tastic sometimes, a little, you know, challenging other days, but it's gonna be okay. That resonates. And and this all was um, began uh, as part of our lives. So it was just over three years ago um, that I was diagnosed. So um, actually, I, well, yeah, three and a half, four years ago, um, we it was my daughter first, and she's just turned 11, so she was seven, that's right, and then our middle guy, and then my husband, and then me, and then our youngest, and we always said with the last one that, you know, if he had been neurotypical, we wouldn't have known what to do with him, so we were sort of, you know, in, relieved in the end, um, and um, as so many uh, families of kids on the spectrum know, you know, our eldest at that point, she had just such splintered skills in that, you know, she's seven and she was, we were talking about our daughters before we started, Leslie and I, and absolutely hyperlexic, you know, crazy, just wanted to be in the books all the time, which I can completely identify with that, I get that, and, um, but what do you do in a, in a classroom when the child's reading, she was reading in a high school level, and, you know, but socially and just organizationally, because uh, executive functioning, it's just that inside of your head CEO, how do I organize myself, was not even close to where the rest of her peers were. So in the span of two years, she was in five different classrooms and never changed because of bad behavior, just really because schools didn't know what to do with a child like mine, you know, and, um, so, my background happens to be in education and um, and also in social work. And so, having been at that point very recently diagnosed as SB, honestly, that didn't even occur to me that that was going to be part of the story, except for the fact that I taught. We decided to to homeschool for one year, and and then we would, you know, reexamine and see what we would do then. And um, during that year because I had the background in education, all that stuff, did that play in? Did that make me more successful with her? Maybe. But honestly, I think what happened was I was waiting, like so many of us, you know, us parents, where we're all waiting to hear, you're doing this wrong and you're doing that wrong from all of the various therapists that are in our lives. And instead, it was, why are you doing that? That's really cool. Why are you doing that? That's really cool. And I thought, I don't even know what I'm doing. That's really cool, you know? <laughs> because the truth was, mind blindness. I really didn't know what I knew that they didn't know. Does that make sense? Yes. It's hard to figure out if this is my normal. Well, I don't know what's that like for you. I grew up as an only child. People would say, what's it like being an only child? And I would say, well, what's it like having a brother or sister? You know, I don't know. This is just the way it is. Um, and so um, in the summer of 2011, um, they three of them in the span of one week said, um, all right, you've got to either start a school, which I laughed at because at that point I had a seven, four, and one-year-old. Um, and they said, or write a book. And I thought, all right, fine. I've always, writing's been something that's easy for me, so whatever, I'll just sit down and do it. And in a typical ASCII fashion, you know, head focus, hyper focus, sat down and in three weeks wrote a book and submitted it. And um, that was the manuscript for what became um, Asperger, uh, sorry, Asperger Kids, an insider's guide to loving, understanding, and teaching children with um, Asperger syndrome. And in a very, you know, I have to think pre-planned kind of way, I, um, I submitted it to um, Jessica Kingsley Publishers in London. And within two days, had an email from 
uh, the CEO asking, "Do there, I have the rest of the manuscript?" And I said, "Why, well, yes, I do." And uh, within three weeks, had a had my first book co contract, and that book came out in um, May of uh, 2012. And on that same day, when it came out, won the Temple Grandin Award um, for um, best international contribution. Um, to the global community by someone on the spectrum, which like talk about knock me over with a feather, right? Because I mean, you know, what is that about? That's just crazy me, you know. And so, um, since that time, um, my fifth book. Let's see. So that was May 2012. The fifth book uh, in the series just came out um, last week, and I am presently working on number six. So um, it has been a profound and awesomely cool experience. Now what kind of audience were you hoping to reach with, um, oh, I was going to say with your first book, but with all of them, like did you did you hope to to reach a, the parents, did you hope to reach the kids, did you hope to reach the, the educators, did you hope to reach all of them? What really was your goal? Different depending upon the books. Um, so of course when I set out to write the first book I didn't expect that there would be, you know, at least five more to come afterwards, right? Um, so when I wrote that book, um, it was really, and, and that's sort of the subtitle, you know, loving, understanding, and teaching, right? So I guess that sort of talks about the three, which is that for parents, for um, family members, because you get that dismissive, especially if you've got a child who is not, um, quote unquote, more obviously challenged, right? But it sometimes can be those more subtle ways, or it looks you know, like a behavioral issue and just tantrum, where it's this, that, or the other thing. Um, that can be really hard, especially especially if you have a girl. Um, I, a classic story was that my daughter, um, not long after she was diagnosed, her teacher, who was a 30-year you know, career teacher, had us all in a room um, at a conference, and she said, I just I don't believe this diagnosis is accurate. And as we all know who get the diagnosis, this is not like a rubber stamp. You don't get this, you know, easily. No. Uh, and not so, at all. No. And so I'm going, hmm, really? Okay. You know, and I'm trying to I'm trying to be respectful here. But um, right. and she said, um, you know, I just, I don't see anything in her that recollects any of the students that I've taught before with Asperger's. And, and I said, um, you know, no offense meant in any way. Um, just curious how many of those children were girls. And it was none. And I said, okay, then with all due respect, I think you might be wrong. You know? Um, right. and she, well, I actually, my daughter's principal told me oh, yeah. Yeah, that um, she, she disagreed and she wasn't very sure of my daughter's diagnosis because, after all, she didn't look autistic. And I, the entire room went silent and they all rolled their eyes and I bit my tongue. And I slightly said, I'm sorry, but um, autism doesn't have a look. And every year we learn more about autism. And I, I, you know, I, was, I was just, it really threw me. I didn't expect it. But yeah, um, coming from, it's hard. <laughs> Anyway, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, I no, and and you're and that and that's it, and that's the shared journey. I I we began pre our autism journey. Um, my daughter was actually a Mikuish kid, so she had some really completely unrelated, you know, um, medical challenges, and it was all a matter of you know, mama being that mama bear and not accepting, oh, this dismissal or that dismissal. And in the end, um, she had to have some pretty serious neurosurgery where the neurosurgeon said, you know, unequivocally to, to my husband, he said, your wife saved her life. And the reality is that, um, you know, we had already had somebody refer DSS to our house to see whether or not we had, you know, Munchausen's to make this up. You know, the guy was like in and out of our house before he could say lickety split. He was so embarrassed. But, you know, um, the, the point is that when people don't understand they try to naturally sort of throw the spotlight back on you and make you question yourself. And believe me, I did until finally, you know, saw on an MRI that her brain was being pulled out of her skull. And I was like, okay, even I am not that good. I did not make that happen, you know. So, but that prepped me because people would say, but she looks completely fine, right? And we would get that all the time. I was on the family advisory board at our local children's hospital, and that really sort of began my advocacy work. 
And so I got used to that, but she looks so normal thing. Um, so it was more, uh, when, I, when we hit it with the autism and Asperger's, it was, I guess it was more like, you know, here we go again. Um, but the, the follow-up line was great because the teacher said, um, I just think she's a lot more like you, Mr. O'Toole, and she, you know, indicated my husband, and, and then two months later he was diagnosed. And so, I, you know, that was just like, in retrospect, ah! Um, so, but whatever, it's all good. Um, you know, and it, I actually just did a, um, the book I'm working on right now is, is for uh, girls on the spectrum. And um, I, I did the keynote for the National Autism Society of the United Kingdom's uh, Women in Autism Conference in October. And, um, Proud to say that they that they have said since that um, they have just gotten responses unlike ever before, and I think that that again comes from just a widening of an understanding of what you know what Asperger's, what autism can look like. Um, people will, who've known me, you know, for a while, maybe they might if they don't understand what part of what what's what, right? They they don't peg it instantly. But if you explain sort of the persona, uh, oh, okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, there's an article, if I, I may, it's, it's, it's uh, free and it was um, very generous of Australia's um, Autism Asperger's uh, mag or Network magazine. <laughs> um, I wrote an article called Spotting the Pink on the Spectrum and um, they are, you know, proprietary uh, magazine, subscription-based, but very kindly the, um, the response was so powerful that they actually allowed me to share it via the Ask for Kids website for free, the entire article, which was fantastic. Right. At the end of it, um, it gives a really, really good checklist, the first one of its kind, of what it, you know, what you're looking for and what we're talking about with girls. Um, but so I recommend, you know, people if, if you go to the Ask for Kids website and just type in pink in the search, it'll come up. Um, but to your question about my audiences, you know. That's sort of it. Um, I was with that first book trying to reach the families, and that includes, you know, the doubters that might be your mother-in-law or your sister or whomever, right? As well as those who were just so desperate to understand, um, and to them, give the message of, "Hey, this isn't what you expected, but that doesn't mean it's bad." Um, right. You know, how many of us can look at the people we fell in love with over our lifetime and say, "Oh, yeah, that's exactly who I would have expected." And not, not usually. A lot of times, there's, you know, it's it's not on paper what you would expect, and that doesn't mean it's bad. It means it's different, um, and that's okay. Um, right. So, and then, then obviously, the understanding is because I wanted to give from a first-person perspective, what it actually felt like and meant and how to motivate the kids. And that's the last section then is the teaching. It's because I wanted educators, as an educator, I wanted to say, hey, it's not the child's fault. You know, as teachers, it, it's that we have to step up our game then and get creative and don't get complacent. And here's how to do it. You know, these kids are not unreachable at all. Um, the, the power of the special interest and using concrete learning materials and, and how to do it. So that was my audience for the first therapists, parents, families, friends, um, teachers. Um, and then the second book in the series, uh, I call this The Conditioner. The first one was The Shampoo. It was helping everybody who's not on the spectrum understand the kids is the conditioner to the shampoo, which is the Asper Kids Secret Book of Social Rules. And, um, and I love the cover design for that oh God, uh, the notebook. Oh, that, I didn't know that. That's fantastic. I love how it looks like a notebook. And it just, I was like, oh, that's great. She'll be so proud that you said that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That was completely her idea. And I'm supposed to say that every time it ever comes up. So I am now done <laughs> I do just, yeah, due diligence. Um, you know, I'm, I'm you, you can go through a litany of awards, and those are wonderful. And they are wonderful. And I don't, but the truth is that when I see all of the books being bestsellers and even more so that I am so blessed every week to get just phenomenal letters from um, adults who are absolutely reading the uh, Secret Book of Social Rules. It says for tweens and teens, well, I will tell you that at least the you know, 25% to 30% of the book book's readership are adults, um, which makes perfect sense because I wrote it for myself. 
Um, it was post-diagnosis. I started noticing all these little social rules. Oh, 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 got to write that down. Oh, oh, oh. And honestly, I had a therapist say to me, could you, could you make a book out of that? And I said, why? You think other people need interest? <laughs> and it's now, um, I think, one of the all-time bestsellers in, in the um, uh, market in, in, in our particular niche. But when you see the response being from both the kids and, you know, um, I say kids, like meaning like well into twenties, by the way, um, and you know, and from the adults who love them or are working with them. When you see that the response is consistently and over and over, this is the first time I've heard anything positive about my child. That breaks my heart. Yeah, that breaks my heart. Um, yeah, it breaks my heart too. Like that's that's why I started writing too because I was so sick and tired of seeing. Everything negative, and I, no, right. I don't see negativity in my children, so I want exactly. other people to, to have a different view, too. Exactly. So with each book, you know, um, there has definitely been, a, there's always a crossover, there's always a, you know, um, there's oh, I, because the parents are also reading the Tween Teen book because they want to understand what's going on, or the school psychologist is, or this, you know, the social group leader. But when I find out that, like, teenagers are sneaking the book into school with them, or that some of the little sticky note quotes are ending up as, like, the school's, you know, quote of the week on the, on the wall for everybody, that makes it. I mean, that's just the bomb, right? You know? And, yeah. Um, yeah, and then so, um, and through the subsequent books, um, you know, we've um, had the... Uh, not Your Average Coloring Book, which is actually primarily drawn by kids on the spectrum around the world, um, because a lot of kids on the spectrum do not like art, and so specifically, my daughter had been made fun of for the way she colored, and so I thought, you know what, you don't have to like to color, but you're gonna not going to not color because other people said you're a bad colorer, and so, you know, we made a coloring book that had literary heroes and Fibonacci sequence and geometry and science and nature, right, you know, and, um, and history, and, um, and talked about, I mean, for crying out loud, when I saw the Last for Kids Launchpad, which is the third book, and it's it was on a top 100 list on Amazon for home design, which cracks me up because I, like, have no interior design skills whatsoever, but it's just about laying out your home to empower the kids and teach them independence and process. Yes, we each got different audiences, but they all overlap and, um, you know, kind of work hand in hand, and that's been so exciting and seems to be happening with the newest book, Game Plan, too, so I'm really happy about that. Now, is the, the Ask for His Launchpad the home design that empowers everyday superheroes? Now, is that is it sensory-focused, or do you discuss a variety of topics relating to the home design? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's a variety of topics. Um, so it's about the people, um, the place, and the process of, of balancing um, responsibility and choice um, about the physical layout. I mean, it's literally, I can say this because I didn't take the pictures, it is gorgeous, um, and it is um, my own house, which is not, you know, going to necessarily be on whatever, but it, it was, you know, better homes and gardens, but it was the little things that whether you've got a five-year-old or whether you have a 15-year-old or a 25-year-old that you can do around the house um, that save the sanity of, of morning or downtime and also teach these brilliant children and I say brilliant regardless of whether they're nonverbal or whether they're, you know, hanging out in the men's group. It doesn't matter. We know creativity is a buzz inside those little heads, right? You know, of setting it up in a way that teaches the basic skill of self-reliance and also of process, of learning how to do something, even if it's sweeping up the crumbs under a table, from beginning to end, from figuring out the materials you need, being able to access them, going through the steps of the process, being able to assess when it's done, what to do with that, and then how to finish the task completely and put it away. That will apply to homework, will apply to, you know, job training, will apply to college, will apply, your, your marriage, whatever. But learning it in those concrete ways, you instantly feel a part of a team. It is not about adding to mom or dad's to-do to -do list. It's actually about detracting from it. But it's about giving the kids the, the right tools that they need so that they can show themselves and really truly come to believe in their own abilities. Um, that's 
you know, a paramount importance. It's wonderful if your child can memorize the entire periodic table, but, you know, if he can't find his homework. Right. Do- right. I have to say, I, I really love, love that. Um, my, some of my writers are adults with Asperger's, mm-hmm. and they have, they have taught me so much because I, I said to them, you know, I, one of my kids is having a really hard time, and I just, I'm not really sure why. And it's, it's always when we go to upstairs to this one room, and she said, well, is it cluttered? Exactly. Well, well yeah. Well, I don't know. For me, it's not cluttered. Right. I'm a bit of a pack. I'm a bit of a pack rider, <laughs> if I admit. But she said, you can't do that. She said, think of the visual stimulation. She goes, you, you completely forgot about that. And I said, I didn't even think about it. I don't. You know, I, it's really hard for me. I try very hard to understand sure. where my children are coming from. I, I, I'm constantly thinking about, okay, what kind of sensory sensitivities could could be in this, sure. could, could, could there be in this situation? But I hadn't thought about the clutter. I hadn't thought about the color of the walls. And um, and I agree with you about the whole teamwork thing. You know, I want my kids to, to be independent. but I'm also an extremely busy mom, so I can't be picking up after them. And I have I have three kids in four years. I no, can't. Nor should you. Nor should you. Know, right. You know, I want so I can't be there every second. I can't tear my, myself into three. So my kids have, because of that, been forced to learn things at a young age and help mommy out. But it's helping themselves out. And I've always said to people, don't wait until they're 12 years old. To let them help you with the laundry, oh, let them help you with tools. Like it's too late. No. Like, I, I always, right. I tell everybody. I'm like they are part of your family, and I always tell my kids like you're part of the family. We're a team, and well, we all need to work together. So absolutely, you actually- all of my kids do everything from matching socks to Ooh. helping mommy unload the dishwasher. I mean, as soon as you can walk, you're helping. That's right, and it's show, you know it, and that's where the balance of of everything comes, and that's why that book in particular is extremely visually led, um, because I want you to see the pictures of everything that we're talking about, and you know, um, once you've kind of got an understanding of where they're coming from, from those first books, right, and, and then Launchpad is exactly about that, I mean, that's what it's meant to be, is the Launchpad, right, and so that as the, as the kiddo, you don't want to develop that um, learned helplessness, where you truly believe, I-, I can't do it, right? And that doesn't feel good. First no. hand, you know it's true, right? And and so, in fact, that's what we then extended into the book that just came out, which is Ask for Kids Game Plan. It's about purposeful play. And um, it is using ordinary stuff around the house. I'm talking like marbles and rubber bands and, you know, bananas. And being able to teach in really concrete, fun ways Things like, for instance, we use this really cool um, density experiment because if you present it, nobody wants to hear about what you do badly. Like, right? Like, if I was like, Leslie, you're welcome now to this entire class or course or social skills group where we're going to tell you all the things that you have to do better or else no one's ever going to like you. <laughs> Who wants to go to that class? Nobody, right? I mean, nobody. 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 Oh, uh, you always and, learn. My, my father always told me you will never gain anybody's attention by telling them what they did wrong. You always that's start. That's what we're telling the kids. Like, come right. on, the social skills group. It's going to be. No, it's not. You know, it's not. But if you do it this way instead, right? And so you apply. You're teaching it like, ooh, it's this really wackadoodle kitchen science experiment. Cool. And look at it. We're going to pour this amazing tower of density and watch how things, you know, layer upon layer and then shine lights through it. And then and we get really specific. What you end up is this with is this fantastically cool lesson intensity that you can t- turn all the way up if you want to get into what density is and what you know molecules are and da 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 and you can make it as complicated and we give you how to do that or it's just that some things have more matter in them and they're and they matter more and they're going to end up in the in that bottom space that everything has to be built upon it and even if your priority your personal priority is that you desperately want to get to the new you know new minecraft thing that you were doing yesterday but everybody else needs to have that you know but but homework isn't done or um i don't know you have to go buy a new pair of shoes yep that's boring you're right it is boring but it's a priority and it's the foundation and you can see it 
and so we tattoo bananas and we do fried marbles and all these ways of absolutely teaching cool academic things but really that's just the way to get in um, to teach those basic concepts of social skills constructs you know that that truthfully a lot of adults could use help with but we say you know teamwork teamwork have you ever broken down what it means to be on a team or what your team expects of you if you're playing a game and you don't know the rules like, you're gonna fail and you're going to feel like a failure and so that's where I keep trying you know um, to give fun ways because no one we I refuse to do boring fun ways to get at these really sort of abstract difficult ideas that otherwise the kids aren't going to want to you know so right. um, I, I used to be an educator as well so I am always uh, I'm actually going to be giving a speech in LA in August about out-of-box teaching for the out-of-box learner yeah. and uh, essentially my first line is nobody's in the box there's very few people that are so we need to start teaching differently because um, you know I saw on your website like you you yourself don't give any Bueller Bueller speech and <laughs> I said you know I can't tell you how many kids are like when I was teaching or when I um, how people said you know it's you're never boring you know even if uh, even if we're adding we're it's, it, why does it have to be right and that's what I said I said I don't understand why why we all need to sit at a desk and stare stare at each other at stare at the chalkboard until you know absolutely. I don't want to do that you know no, me either. exactly I don't want to teach that way like that's no. boring for me to teach that way that I can't imagine having to be the student to well, well that, I have I have experience being taught that way so I don't know uh, so we all right no but right? that's one of the things that oh Lord I mean God bless me you know I'll, I'll, I was having it happened to come in a bunch that I had a bunch of parents write about you know their kids having to do flashcards and help because rote memory can sometimes just get in the way when the kids are ready to go into more advanced concepts and they just can't remember some basic facts and you know, uh, and they were having to do flashcards and flashcards as I say flashcards are lame so I made you know sitting in my downstairs playroom ain't nothing fancy people you know I just it is me and a, like you know a lightsaber and plastic cups nailing out like you know what this is a way to learn all your math facts or all the things on the periodic table or all the parts of speech go ready smash it with a it's called so it's again it's called flashcards are lame and it's a video and an entire like activity you know guide because that's it's a download why because you need it now you don't want to think about it and like have one more thing to do and go to the store no, you just need to make your life easier now. And trust me, like you're saying, when you're living the life, I'm getting, I get this because this is our life, you know. And um, I don't know, have one more minute, you know, or mama's going to need another margarita, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so, so your latest book is The Game Plan. Um, right. That's, and it just came out, right? Good. Yeah, yeah. So. so, and your website is asperkids.com. Now, you started the whole LLC of Asperkids, right? Because several, yeah, is... several, well, I guess several years ago. No, it was only 18 months ago. And, um, yeah, actually what we're getting ready to do, um, right, Asperkids became an LLC, a multimedia social education company. And really what that means is I didn't want to be constrained um, by, you know, it's only going to be about books. No, because there's there are also videos and there are um, you know games and there like we do a self, congratulations you're an Asper kid kit where it's a way of telling the kid on the spectrum hey you rock and by the way let's have some fun here you know and you're part of this group um, and in the next very short while we're actually going to be expanding both upward and outward. Um, we're creating um, a nonprofit organization um, foundation called the Awesomeness Foundation, um, which will then sort of help us be able to fund awesomeness wherever we see it. And um, right, yeah. And so under that umbrella, literally, um, there will you know, we've got Asper Kids, and then uh, the two other parts that will first be coming into play are um, the Academy or Academy AK, which is going to be booster shot. Learn. It's basically Khan Academy that's, again, as we say, not lame. And so there will be academic classes, there will be booster shots for parents, there will be booster shots for educators, there will be, you know, social skills classes, but not in lame, boring ways, but, you know, literally me sitting here and, and 
you know, being able to give. Some of them are going to be live so that that um, they have Facebook forums so the kids can, you know, have friends who are like them around the world. I and mean, that's one of my favorite things about when we do the congratulations kit. The kids come on, then they, the parents send in a picture of their child once they're, they've gotten this shirt that's part of their, the kit. Um, and they we post the picture on Facebook, and they get congratulations mes messages from literally like around the world. So you'll have four continents of people saying, you're amazing. And, and that, how do you do that? So um, on Ask for Kids, if you go to the shop, um, if you just go to shop, uh, it'll come up. Um, it's one of our main products, and it's the the uh, congratulations you're an Asper Kid kit. And in there, we have um, we made collectors cards, which an Asper Kid drew. She's 18, and they're called Among Heroes cards. And so they're quotes and cartoon versions of heroes on the spectrum. And then you know, there's um, like in the teen girl one, there's you know paperback novel perfume and what like <laughs> things, right exactly. It's great. Really, it's great. I, have to, I, have, I I think that's what I'm gonna give my daughter for her birthday. Yes. Nobody and tell. I'm you that every time, every time we then post it, um, they get like giant microbes. You either get a brain like a giant plush brain cell or a giant kissing disease like mono. You know, which is funny. It's just funny, right? So, but then we put it on the website, right? I mean, on Facebook, and they get literally congratulations messages from around the world and. There are every time, you know, uh, parents will write back and say, "My my child, who, and I'm using the word that they use, hated themselves, um, or was hurting themselves." Um, the line that one woman said was, uh, one girl said was, um, "It made me believe that I'm not a mistake; I'm a miracle." How do you do better than that? Like that's just. That's the good stuff, right? right. So um, we're hoping that then the academy will um, offer so that if we're, you know, like I said, there'll um, be relationship building classes and as well as academics so that if people are homeschooling or they just want booster things for their kids because they're interested in learning more, great. And then, you know, let sure, why not learn? About latitude and longitude and geography by doing by doing geocaching, or why not learn about architecture by using Minecraft? Why why not? You know, right. and and then my own my own Ruby slippers, which is going to be a girl empowerment um, website, which which is starting with a um, book that I'm working on now for girls and and some fiction that I'm working on for them as well, and um, some fantastic collaborations because uh, as folks who do read that pink article or um, we'll see. Um, so many girls are misdiagnosed or under they are underdiagnosed, you know, and um, as a result, there are, are some pretty serious. Um, I, I don't know any women who were diagnosed as adults, and and all ASPE women that I know were diagnosed as adults because that wasn't a language that was you know in the vernacular when we were kids. Right, um, it wasn't even a diagnosis available no, until '94. No. So smart for your own good. What does right. that? Mean? What does that even mean? Right? Like, okay, but but you just pick your picky eater. Oh that yeah, it's too smart for your own good. Mm -hmm. Right, but every one of us has had um, has dealt with eating disorder in some way or another, and um, dealt with some kind of dating violence at some point. And that really comes from you know, the, the line, um, you know, when you think you're difficult to love, you'll love for for crumbs. And so the consequences are serious, but but the intervention is easy and it's totally doable. And I think that. The kids like hearing it from someone who is like them. You know, that's and that's a privilege to me. So, um, so those are the two additional LLCs that'll be coming under the Awesomeness Foundation, and hopefully there will be even more to come as we see um, ways to to make this journey an adventure that every that everyone is glad to be on. That's fantastic. I thank you for clarifying all of that for me because oh, there's. there's yeah. There's so much on there. I said, oh, I don't even know where to start. Like, when I started writing questions for you, I was like, oh, my goodness. I, I'm not sure where to begin. But, um. Oh, good. I, I feel that way every day of my life, Leslie. Don't worry. <laughs> coffee. So, That's where I begin. Coffee. <laughs> coffee, yeah. I have copious amounts of coffee. I hope. I've always said if I could um, walk around with an IV of caffeine. Well, you know, it's funny that you say that, though, because I actually went to my doctor, oh, I don't know, maybe 18 months ago, my, my, my psychiatrist uh, for just med tech, and um, I was joking about the amount of coffee that I was drinking. 
and this is pre Keurig days, so I couldn't brew like one cup at a time, you know, and I'd have to make the whole pot. And he, you know, he, I said something about drinking a whole pot, and he's like, oh, that's pretty funny. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm actually kind of being serious. And he said, really? Let's do a little test. For, <laughs> let's do a little test for ADD. And I said, you know, I mean, school was easy for me, so I thought, don't you think I would have known? And he's like, well, let's just ch bombed it, bombed it. And since being on on stimulants, I got to tell you, I have like a cup. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So there you go. Who <laughs> knew? I always, um, I don't know, my, my grandmother always raised me to the to the idea of it's a sin to waste. So I would brew a pot and then I'd almost feel bad that I was wasting it. So I would of keep course. drinking, keep drinking. But I started drinking a lot of coffee when I was in, I believe it was 13. And I wanted to finish my research papers. And I wanted to do it well. And, and I was, but I was juggling sports and honors classes. And so... I would stay up all night to make sure that everything was perfect, and um, that that just turned into being a perfectionism. What's that? I don't relate to that at no, all. No, no, no perfectionist in you at all. <laughs> so anyway, I just have one last question for yeah. you. Um, what's the what's the if you had to pick one? And I know it's going to be hard, but if you had to pick one thing yes. that you wish you could tell all parents that have children on the spectrum, what would that be? The number one thing. Okay, it's, it's a two-part sentence, though. It's, um, no, we'll just go with this. Because so, so often people are telling us and, and looking at behavior and problems, and it's this, it's that the nemesis of all things and all people awesome is anxiety and that misbehavior is almost always missed behavior because your kids are asking for help. They want to know why they're different and that telling them why is a blessing, not a curse. Because once you understand yourself and once you understand us, anything, anything is possible. And not to limit your child by your own fear of what that label means. A label is like push or pull on a door. It just tells you what to do. And then you're in the door. And anything can happen. I, I think you just you just made me speechless there for a minute, which does not happen very often. So. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. Not the speechless but, yeah. part, but like the... <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's fantastic. Yeah, I... I see that a lot um, <clears throat> in, in a lot of people. The anxiety is really the number one problem. And, um, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I always, I always try to tell people, if people are like, I don't want to label my child. And I say, you can't, you can't help your child know who they are and, and get them the help that they need if, if you continue to ignore what's there. There's nothing wrong with, with, uh, with saying your child has Asperger's. No, I, I think if you, um, if you get... The, the, there's another another blog, but it's called Rebranding Aspie on the website. Um, but it's exactly to that point. Um, it was a magazine piece that I wrote, but it was exactly that point. You know, um, if you are ashamed of uh, the label woman or mother, or if someone's ashamed of the label gay, um, that means they're ashamed or being taught to be ashamed of part of who they are, mm -hmm. and the world is already going to make us feel frequently enough like we've just stepped in it and we don't know how we got there. So to teach a child to be over worried about any aspect of him or herself is to only condemn that pervasive message um, to be the one that they hear in their head at night instead of, yep, you are different and isn't that fabulous. We celebrate differences in my family. <laughs> you know, we uh, absolutely love, uh, each of us are so different. And I said, but isn't that awesome? I mean, we, together, we're quite powerful because we all, we all draw on our strengths. But okay. I thank you so much for joining me today and explaining all your all your great books and your products. I, I really think it's important that, that the children know that they're not alone. So I really think that that's great. We'll have to look into that for my daughter. But um, for more information about Jennifer, please visit her website at asperkids.com. 
You can buy her books. You can uh, go to Jessica Kingsley Publishers website. Where you can you can all through, the, through us too, through Ask for Kids. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can also buy on askforkids.com, and um, you can, including her the, the coloring book and her latest book, the Ask for Kids Game Plan: the Extraordinary Minds, Pur Purposeful Play, and Ordinary Stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, Jennifer, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. And and to every family and mom and dad and brother and cousin and everybody out there, keep on keeping on. Just remember, it's relentless positivity. Even the days you step on a Lego, you got to choose, and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have a nice day. Bye-bye.